Welcome to Time Traveling Team, the weekly podcast where we review every story of Doctor Who right from the very beginning. I'm Patty. And I'm Trisha. This week we join the Doctor, Zoe, and Jamie as they encounter the Space Pirates. Yar. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be discussing the Doctor, the companions, the villains, and giving the story a final score out of five. We would also love to hear your thoughts on this story, so in order to join the discussion with us, you can check us out at Time Team, that's T-I-M-E-T-E-A-M-P, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can email us at timetravelingteam at teamproductions.com. Now though, I shall give you the story recap for this one. Episode 1. In deep space, a ship docks into an orbital beacon designated Alpha 1. A trio of men, two of them wearing EVA suits, make their way from the ship into the beacon. The two men in EVA suits exit the beacon by a hatchway and attach a device to its exterior hull. Another man enters the beacon and asks for a status report from the other man, whose name is Jervis. Jervis tells him that the engineers have attached the device, and once they have left the beacon, they can detonate it via radio beam. They all enter the ship, and after they have gotten to a safe distance from the beacon, they blow it up. In a different part of space, another ship, designated V41L0, is investigating the disappearance of the signal from the beacon. The commander of the ship, General Hernak, and his subordinate, Major Ian Warren, are discussing potential reasons for the loss of the signal. Hernan then owns a comm channel throughout the ship and reveals to all the crew that the various beacons and shipping lanes are being targeted by a highly organised band of space pirates. He says their goal is to break the beacons down and rob passing cargo to the ship of their supplies of Argonite, the single most valuable mineral in existence. He then calls all section commanders to a meeting to discuss their new objectives. Warren then says that there are 17 other beacons in that sector, but it will be almost impossible to predict where the pirates will strike next. Hernak, however, says that they will stake out the Pliny system which has four beacons in it and will be a very tempting target. The pirate ship approaches another beacon, designated Alpha 7, and the pirates go about their destructive plans. Dervis voices his concerns to his leader, whose name is Caven, saying that going after the beacons too quickly will bring the space core down on top of them. Caven, however, says that they will be too busy dealing with the multiple interplanetary conflicts currently raging in the galaxy. He tries to take Dervis's mind off things by saying how much each of the beacons is worth. Dervis, who previously worked as an engineer on Earth, agrees the compensation is worth the risk. Back on V41, Harnack tells Warren that they will orbit the planet Ta, which is on the edge of the Pliny system. The long-range scanners pick up the pirate ship at the Alpha 7 beacon, but they are too far away to get an exact identification of the ship. They make their way towards the beacon as the pirate ship moves away, and a few moments later the beacon is destroyed. Harnack orders the pirate ship to be pursued, but they lose visual contact when the pirate ship outdistances its pursuer. Harnack resignedly orders the helmsman to maintain course in the hopes of picking up a trail. Harnack and Warren begrudgingly acknowledge the skill and the efficiency of the pirates, and Harnack says their only chance to stop the pirates is to man each of the beacons. He tells Warren to organise small teams to be dropped off at each one, and to give them two months' supplies. At Beacon Alpha 4, Warren instructs Lieutenant Joe Sorba on how to use a deep space transmitter so he and his team of four guards can call for help if need be. Moments after the ship leaves, the TARDIS arrives in the beacon's computer bay and is discovered by one of the guards. He reports to Sorba, who gathers the rest of the team to go investigate. The Doctor, Jamie and Zoe exit the TARDIS, and the Doctor immediately starts to investigate the various pieces of equipment in the room, which all seem to be operating automatically. Jamie feels uneasy about their surrounding, and urges the Doctor and Zoe to return to the TARDIS, but the other two say that they should look around first. Sorba and his men arrive, though, and he orders them to surrender, but instead they flee through a door on the other side of the room, which Jamie manages to close amidst a string of laser fire from the guards. They then make their way down the corridors of the beacon, trying to find a way back into the computer bay, but they are unaware that Sorba and his men are, have started hunting them. They are making their way into another corridor, and the Doctor seals the hatchway behind them. However, they discover it to be a dead end and stare on in horror as their assailants start to cut through the hatch. While this is going on, the pirate ship docks at the beacon, and upon entering it, they hear the firing of the lasers in the distance. Kevin makes his way towards the sound of the laser rifles, and he then ambushes Sorba and his guards, killing all of them except Sorba, who was only wounded when he dashed at the transmitter to V41. Dervis starts to panic, but Caven tells him to calm down and to start setting the demolition charges. Dervis leaves whilst Caven destroys the transmitter, which is a wasted effort as Harnack set a course to return to Alpha 4 when they first got the signal. Sorber regains consciousness, and Caven mocks him over the fact that he is alone. Sorber then asks him how he was able to get his decoys on board in order to distract anyone from noticing the pirate ship until it was too late. Caven denies having anyone else on board, and then orders the newly arrived Dervis to take Sorba away. He then shoots the controls from the door into the corridor, trapping the TARDIS crew on the other side. The travellers notice the silence from outside the door, and prepare to leave when they hear the space pirates in EVA suits outside planting charges. They decide to try and get back to the TARDIS, but they discover the door won't open. The 
pirates leave the station and the crew of V41, which is still 90 minutes away, look on it in resignation as the beacon starts to blow apart, completely unaware of the travellers trapped inside it. Episode 2. Harnack asks for the location of the pirate ship, but grows frustrated with the crew when he is told that the debris from the beacon is causing interference with the radar. Warren helps him to see that he is being unfair to the crew, and then they turn their attention back to the pirates. Warren says that they must have a base somewhere in the sector, and Harnack says that if they can locate it, they can launch their Minnow class attack fighters to defeat the pirates. Warren says they could try tracking down a piece of the beacon, as it is being sent to the base by its Argonite chemical signature, but Harnack says that without scanners it would be next to impossible. They then lament the loss of Sorba and his men. Just then, the radar operator reports an incoming ship in the vicinity of the beacon, but it seems to be flying too erratically to be one of the pirate ships. They then see on the long-range scanner that it is an old disused freighter model. The captain of the freighter, which is designated Liz 79, is sitting down to a hearty breakfast when he is interrupted by a call from Harnack. Warren gives the vehicle registration to Harnack, and he recognises the captain as Milo Clancy, who is something of the legend in the space freighter community. Harnack tells Milo to prepare for a boarding party to come on board. Warren says that Milo shouldn't cause too much trouble, but Harnack is not so confident, saying the old-time freighter captains like Milo don't respond well to authorities like the Space Corps. Milo is brought on board and asked by Warren and Harnack what he is doing out there without a proper transponder on his ship, but he brushes off them with rambling excuses. He then reveals that he is also hunting the pirates as they have been hijacking his Argonite convoys for the last two years and his reports to the Space Corps High Command have been ignored. Harnack says that if he assists them in finding the pirates, he can claim compensation for his lost cargo, but Milo is sceptical of their chances of catching them, saying that the pirates are using a ship that is too fast for the V-41 to catch. Meanwhile, back on the beacon, it is revealed that the demolition charges separated the various sections of the beacon rather than outright destroying it. In their section, the doctor slowly comes to and starts to wake up his young friends, using some oxygen tanks to help bring them around. After they all awake, they take stock of their surroundings and find the door still closed. The doctor climbs a chair to see if he can access the hallway through the air ducts and is shocked to see the destruction of the beacon. Jamie says that means that they are stranded as they cannot access the TARDIS, and the doctor realises that Sorb and his men were trying to defend the beacon. Zoe says that they will most likely drift aimlessly through space, but the doctor says that he notes that each section of the beacon has rockets attached to them, and they seem to be keeping separate pieces of the beacon moving together roughly a mile apart. Jamie says that they could still get back to the TARDIS, but the others say that the distance is too great to cross without the right equipment. The doctor then hears a strange buzzing sound from behind a panel and goes to investigate. Zoe says to Jamie that he is most likely doing this to keep their spirits up, as they have most likely only a few hours to live. Jamie is then taken aback by this estimate, and Zoe points out that they are both finding it difficult to breathe due to the diminishing oxygen in the section. Back on V41, Milo is allowed to go back to his own ship, and Warren voices his suspicions that he could be in league with the pirates. Harnack agrees with him, saying that that is why he allowed Milo to leave, as he thinks he is actually the ringleader of the pirates. Warren then orders a minnow to be made ready to launch with a full arsenal, and he then takes off after Milo's ship. Harnack tells him to keep his distance, as Milo is not to be underestimated. He then says that he is taking the ship to Ta, and tells Warren to relay his reports via the nearest beacon to him. On Ta, Harnack is hosted by Madeline Isagiri, the head of the Isagiri Mining Company, and he tells her about his suspicions of Milo. She says that he would have no reason to steal Argonite due to him owning several functioning mines. Harnack is surprised by her defence of him, as he was implicated in the death of her father, Dom, who he was once in partnership with, but nothing was ever proven. He says that Milo's mines aren't as lucrative as the ones on Ta, and that Milo could be in league with the pirates in order to get revenge on her accusations against him. On the beacon, the Doctor reveals that the sections of the beacon were actually being held together by strong electromagnetic fields that the demolition charges disrupted. He says that if he can increase the output from their section, he could pull one of the other ones back to them, and then repeat the process until they reach the TARDIS. Zoe highlights the potential danger of them actually making their field interact with one of a similar polarity, which could cause them to shoot off into deep space. The Doctor tells her not to be a pessimist, and starts to work on the magnets. The going gets tougher as more and more oxygen is used, but eventually the Doctor finishes and tells the others to brace themselves. However, Zoe's fears prove to be true, as the section is repelled away from the others, and they are shot off into space. The doctor says that they are too far away for him to try again to re-establish the field with the correct section. Back on Ta, Warren reports that Milo is approaching a section from the Alpha 4 beacon, and Harnack says that this is the proof that he has been waiting for, despite Madeline suggesting that it could just be idle curiosity on Milo's part. Harnack orders Warren to arrest Milo, but tells him to destroy his ship if he resists. Back on the beacon, the travellers are sharing the last of their oxygen supply when they see bolts from one of the wall panels fall off. 
They then see a fully armoured Milo enter carrying a gun, and Jamie tries to defend the others, but he is shot by Milo and falls to the ground motionless. A shock Zoe calls Milo a murderer. Episode 3 Harnack orders the ship to go and gives support to Warren in case he runs into trouble with Milo. He tells Madeline that he will stay on town with a small contingent of guards so he can also keep an eye out for the pirates and keep in contact with Warren. Madeline thinks he's overreacting for just one man, especially someone as pitiful as Milo. She says that she offered to buy out his mines from him, but he refused but never gave her a reason as to why. Just then, Warren videos in and says that he is not receiving any answers from his hails to Milo's ship. Harnack tells him to keep trying for a few more minutes, but if he still gets no answer, then he needs to prepare his missiles to open fire on the ship. On the beacon, Milo tells Zoe and the Doctor to stay back, but they go to check on Jamie, and the Doctor reveals that he is merely stunned. Milo comments that they can't be pirates, and demands to know who they are and how they got onto the beacon. He grows frustrated when he thinks that they are lying to him, but their discussion is interrupted when Warren starts firing warning shots across Milo's ship, which causes the beacon to shake violently. They all rush from the beacon into the ship, and Milo then takes off. Warren orders Milo to surrender, but instead, Milo takes evasive action and tries to outrun the minnow. He then releases a cache of copper needles out into space that causes the minnow's tracking equipment to malfunction, thereby allowing Milo to slip away. Milo explains how the copper interacts with the Argonite, and he discovers that none of the travellers have heard of it, leading them to explain about the TARDIS. The Doctor asks if Milo can drop them back to where the beacon was, but he says that he doesn't know where it is as the pieces were retrieved by the pirates. Milo says that they should leave the area anyway, lest Harnack send more minnows after them. As they are leaving, Zoe asks Milo how his ship wasn't affected by the copper, and he says it is constructed from an entirely different material called tilium. On Ta, Harnack grows irate when Warren makes his report about what happened. He relays this to Madeline, who allows him to continue using his communication equipment, and he calls his ship. He tells him to launch the rest of the minnows and that they are to destroy Milo's ship on sight. He then says he will depart to pick up other guard squads from the remaining beacons, and once they are ready, they will make their way back to the planet Lobos, where he thinks Milo is harboring the pirates. As he is leaving, he notices a scale model of a Data Bark frigate, which he says looks similar to the one that the pirates are using. He thinks Milo must have purchased it with funds gathered from his Argonite mines and presented it to the pirates. Madel again voices her scepticism of Milo's part in the tests, but she cannot persuade him to see things from her eyes. After Harnack departs, she picks up a phone but pauses before using it. On Milo's ship, Jamie is feeling the effects of subsonic travel, and the doctor points out that one of the pressure gauges seems to be approaching critical. Milo says it is the thermal nuclear reactor, but there's nothing to worry about. He then reveals he is planning to go to Ta and hide there until things calm down. Zoe comments on the topography of the planet, and Milo informs her that everyone lives underground due to the high intensity ultraviolet beams hitting the surface, which will again aid their covert approach to the planet. He then begins his landing approach, which throws the others to the ground as they are not used to that kind of travel. They land successfully in an underground launching platform, but Milo tells him to stay inside whilst he goes to fix one of the ship's generators. After he leaves, Jamie voices his own suspicions of Milo to the doctor, but he tells Jamie that they must trust him as he is their best hope of getting back to the TARDIS. However, he says that it might not be that simple depending on whether or not they can find the pirate base, as they may have already carted off the broken remnants of the beacon. Zoe, who has been observing a star chart this whole time, voices that it would be relatively easy to find it as she has calculated the most likely location from the various information surrounding the assaults on the beacons and the Argonite transports. She says she has also factored in the Doctor's error with the electromagnetic field and reveals that the base is most likely 10 miles from their current location. Showing a small bit of jealousy, the Doctor reassures a concerned Jamie that they will be able to get the TARDIS back, but both he and Zoe are more concerned over the fact that Milo might be a pirate, and they suggest that they should leave. The Doctor agrees and says that if he is a pirate, then they stand a good chance of finding the TARDIS at their current location. Milo returns to find them gone, and then grabs his stun gun to go after them. In the pirate base, Caven calls Jervis away from his task of melting down the bits of Argonite from the Alpha-1 beacon, and tells him that he has a new assignment for him. He is to oversee the delivery of the Argonite from the Alpha-4 beacon to the planet Lobos. Jervis says it is too risky due to all the Space Corps personnel in the area, but Caven forces him at gunpoint to obey. Suddenly, an alarm sounds and an announcement comes through that there are intruders in the tunnels at the base perimeter. In the tunnels, the travellers have gotten lost, and as they are discussing the best way to move forward, the Doctor brings their attention to a strange sound coming from nearby. Jamie points out the light coming from the gaps in the wall, and Zoe asks for a boost so she can see through a fissure in the rocks. She reports that she saw men in welding gear dismantling the beacon, putting the pieces into a furnace. She says that they must be definitely in the pirate base, but she didn't see any sign of the TARDIS. The Doctor starts to think about how to deal with the pirates when he and the others are caught in a spotlight. They turn to see Caven and a few men aiming their weapons at them, and they run for cover into a nearby opening in the rocks, which turns out to be a pitfall, and they fall into it screaming. Episode 4. The trio make a hard landing in an underground room, 
more so for the doctor due to the drawing pins in his pants pocket. Jamie, nursing a twisted ankle, takes a look at her new surroundings with Zoe, and she comments that it appears to be some sort of jail cell. Suddenly, they hear a moaning coming from one corner of the cell, and the doctor indicates for the others to stay back whilst he goes to take a look. Jamie instead picks up a large rock and moves to support the doctor, but he stands down when they see that the moaning is coming from the dazed and injured form of Lieutenant Soba. The doctor starts the tenting using water left to him by the prison guards, and he slowly comes around. Recognising them, he regards them warily, saying that they are responsible for the death of his men, but Jamie says that they were victims of the pirates as well. The doctor says that they all need to work together to get out, but Sorba says he has checked every inch of the cell, and he says that he hasn't found a way out. The doctor points out the bowl holding the water, saying that it is too fragile to survive the drop that they just experienced, and therefore there must be another way in and out of the cell. The doctor starts using a stethoscope to try and find deformities in the wall, and he eventually finds a secret doorway locked by an audio lock. He then produces a tuning fork and begins to hit it, whilst Jamie and Zoe wonder if he hurt his head on the way down. Up in his office, Caven calls through to Dervis, who again begs to be allowed to return. He says that there is a Space Corps vessel en route to the beacon sections as well, and he wouldn't be able to escape it in time if it carries on towards him. His pleas fall on deaf ears though, as Caven orders him to carry on. Dervis says that he will return anyway, but stops when Caven shows him a detonator, which he reveals is attuned to a bomb on Dervis's ship. Left with no other choice, Dervish carries on towards the beacon sections and reports the missing section that the travellers were in. He says that he will go and question Sorba about them, as he had previously mentioned about there being others on board the beacon. Meanwhile, on V41, the recently arrived Warren joins Harnack on the bridge and fills him in on what happened. Harnack berates him for getting tricked by Milo and says that it won't happen again as they are en route to Lobos to catch Milo on his own home turf. Suddenly, the radar technician reports a vessel near the beacon components of Alpha 4, and Harnack says that they are one step closer to catching Milo. He dispatches Warren back to his minnow and then they sends out the ship al wide alert, telling everyone to prepare for the emergency action while they set off in pursuit of the pirate ship. Realising that they probably won't be able to catch it in time if it notices them, Harnack gives Warren the order to destroy it if necessary. Warren's present is noticed by Dervis who reports back to Caven and asks for advice on how to proceed as Warren's ship is faster and stronger than the pirate vessel. However, Warren loses sight of the ship and then requests aid from V41 to try and locate it. They manage to find it again as it connects to a strange nose cone that is designed to boost its speed. Hernak, who's been watching through a view screen, calls off the attack as he says the nose cone is the same type used by the ships of the Isagiri Mining Company, and they must have misidentified that ship there by leaving the pirate free to escape again. The doctor's use of the tuning fork yields no results, and Jamie grabs it and throws it away in frustration. Suddenly, a section of the wall opens as the right frequency is struck, but they are greeted by the sight of Milo. They regard him warily, voicing their suspicions of his motives and possible allegiance with the pirates. Milo's attempts to convince them otherwise prove fruitless, and he finally says that without him to guide them, they will be lost in the underground tunnels until they die. The doctor sees their predicament and leads the others out to Milo. As they are about to leave, two guards appear and draw their weapons, but Milo manages to kill one of them. The other escape and manages to raise the alarm, and Milo leads them away through the secret tunnels. The guard reports that they have lost the prisoners, and Caven realises that Milo must be involved as he is the only person who knows the tunnels to their full extent. In the tunnels, the group takes a rest for Zoe and Sorba, and Milo says that he intends to lead them to the Isagari Company offices. He says that he has re-evaluated his suspicions of Madeline being the power behind the pirates since he caught a glimpse of Caven inside the tunnels. They hear someone coming, and they press on again, but the injured Sorba slows them down. Jamie takes the weapon they took from the dead guard and heads back down the tunnel to cover their retreat, and he leaves before Milo can tell him his weapon is running low on power. The doctor then notices a circuit panel on the wall, and Milo says that there is one on every floor. He goes to take a look at it and receives an electric shock from it. He tinkers with it for a bit and tells the others to go on whilst he waits for Jamie. Down the tunnel, Jamie succeeds in killing two guards before his gun runs out of power, and he heads back down to the others, followed by Caven and more of his men. The doctor ushers him on and then flips the switch on the circuit panel before rushing after the others. It is revealed to be a trap when one of Cayman's men tries to pass the circuit panel and gets electrocuted. A shocked Madeline greets Milo and the others when they arrive in her office. Before she can ask any questions, Milo tells her to contact Harnack and tell him to return so that they can defeat the pirates. Madeline scoffs the idea of the pirates using the old mines as a base and says that if, if the pirates are there, then her guards can take care of them. Milo says that they don't stand a chance against the pirates and goes to call Harnack himself, but he is stopped when Madeline pulls a gun on him. Suddenly, Caven and his men enter the room and kill Sorba when he tries to shoot at them. Caven then gloats at Milo. Episode 5 Madeline objects to the killing of Sorba and says that she doesn't want anyone else to die, but Caven tells her that she had better get used to the idea as she has her fair share of the guilt to shoulder as well. 
Jamie, meanwhile, prepares to use the distraction to attack one of the guards, but the doctor and Milo stop him. Caven then orders them to be taken away as he intends to use them as a way of getting rid of Harnack. They are marched down the corridor to a darkened room, which turns out to be a massive study. Milo recognises the portrait above the fireplace and says that it is of his old partner, Dom, Madeline's father. They look around for a light source and Milo says that Dom was very old-fashioned so that they best look out for candles. After a brief demonstration for Zoe's benefit on how to use them, they take a look around and Milo wonders why they were put into this room, which has been apparently sealed since Dom's disappearance. The doctor says that in actuality someone has been in the room recently, pointing to a grandfather clock that seems to be working fine, as if it has just been freshly wound. Zoe then notices a barefoot sticking out from under a tablecloth, and when they lift it up, they see a startled, unkempt man who scuttles away, babbling incoherent gibberish. Above the planet Lobos, Warren sends a message back to Harnack, saying that he found sections of the beacon orbiting the planet, but there is no sign of Milo, telling them that the mines are in a derelict state, and the remaining staff claiming that they haven't seen Milo in weeks. He also says that there is no evidence of the pirate ship having been near the planet, citing the lack of its distinctive radiation signature, and the sections could have been diverted there as a distraction. Harnack orders Warren to return and then checks with the ship's navigator and asks on what course the beacon sections would have originally been taking. The navigator says that if they followed their natural course then they would have ended up orbiting Ta. Meanwhile, Caven and Madeline are arguing over whether or not to cut their losses and flood the tunnels to cover their tracks. Caven says that he has an alternative idea and that he plans on fitting Milo's ship with a remote control override device and a bomb. He says that they can put the prisoners on the ship and launch them into space just as Harnack arrives and since he thinks Milo was the pirate leader, he would most likely give chase. After a bit of a chase, Caven says that he would blow up Milo's ship, and then, after a short cooling-off period, they can resume their piracy on a different planet. Madeline detests the idea and refuses to go along with it, but Caven says that he has more men on the planet than she does, and that he is the one calling the shots now. He then orders the recently arrived dervish to go down to the Milo's ship and fish it with it at the control unit and sabotage its oxygen pump so it will blow up in space. Milo recognises the man as Dom, but he fails to get him to calm down. The doctor tells him to talk to him softly about their past adventures, as that might bring him back around. The anecdotes seem to reach Dom, especially when Milo mentions Madeline. Dom produces a childhood photo of her, but he seems mentally locked on a time when she was six years old. Eventually, Dom recognises Milo, and he starts to behave more cognizantly, saying that there is no escape from the room. He says that Caven imprisoned him, with Milo suggesting that it was done to force a wedge between him and Madeline. Zoe asks why Dom would be kept alive, and the doctor points out that Caven is highly intelligent and that there is an obvious reason for keeping Dom alive. They then discuss their escape plans, but Milo doesn't seem confident as the door is the only way out, but the doctor reminds him that it is also the only way in. Outside the room, Madeline arrives and furiously demands to be let in, angered at the fact that her expressed wishes that no one entered the room were ignored. The guard refuses to let her in, and after she storms off, he calls through to alert Caven. She makes her way back to the office where she encounters Dervis finishing giving instructions over the communicator to his subordinates. Sensing that he too is unhappy with Caven's methods, she tries to appeal to his better nature and get him to help her deal with Caven. However, Dervis is too concerned with what would happen if they fail, and he then leaves despite her pleas. Once she is alone, Madeline goes to the communication station near her desk and starts to broadcast a distress signal to Harnack. Despite the poor signal she managed to get through, before she can reveal anything, Caven arrives and pulls the plug on the call. Madeline stands up to him and says that he had better put her with the prisoners, but he says that she can still be useful. He then tries to hurt Dom if she doesn't comply, showing her a recent picture of him, which startles her as she thought he was dead. She attacks him and sobbingly begs to be taken to see Dom, but he demands that she help him first. Back on V41, Harnack and Warren discuss the call from Madeline. Warren says that Milo must have distracted them with the signal beacon components whilst the pirates landed on Ta to take it over. Harnack orders the ship to return to Ta. He then notices a call from Madeline, who tries to divert him to chase a fake rumour of the pirates being at the other end of the sector. Harnack says that you still need to land on Ta in order to replenish their food and fuel supplies. Caven, who has been watching the exchange, checks in with Dervish, who tells him that they have nearly finished placing the override device on Milo's ship. Inside their cell, the Doctor has been working on an escape plan involving marbles in a melted candle wax. He then places a chair near the door and takes some burning stationery on top of it. The others prepare themselves with whatever they could find to act as a weapon, and the doctor starts to hoist the smoking materials up into a vent near the door. The smoke seeps out into the hallway and the guards go into the room to investigate, but they immediately fall afoul of the doctor's trap as they slip on the marbles before being battered by Milo and Zoe. Word of the escape reaches Caven, who orders them to be recaptured immediately. Madeline gloats over this, but is soon stopped when a report comes in that the prisoners are nearing Milo's ship. Caven tells his men to stop the pursuit so they can reach the ship. Madeline begs him to stop, but he ignores her. 
Meanwhile, the Doctor, Milo and Don reach the ship and Milo prepares to take off, but the Doctor says he needs to go back and find Jamie and Zoe. Just as he leaves though, Kevin orders the override switch to be activated and the ship starts to take off, leaving the Doctor to fall lifelessly to the ground after he's caught in the choking exhaust fumes coming from the departing ship. Episode 6 Jamie and Zoe arrive at the launch platform and they see the rocket taking off and both of them are horrified at the idea of the Doctor leaving them behind. However, they see his body on the floor nearby and Zoe tells Jamie to stay back while she attends to him. She says that his pulse is weak and she gets Jamie to help her move him before the residual fumes finish him off. Meanwhile, on the rocket, Milo realises that the ship is being controlled by an external source and searches the cockpit for the override device. As he is doing this, despite Madeline's pleas for him to stop, Kevin orders Dervis to cut the oxygen supply in the ship. Kevin says that Milo is now most likely trying to find the override device and Dervis says that he will never find it as he used a micro circuit for the task and they will most likely be dead in 10 minutes. They then look at the security cameras and Kevin is free to see that there is no sign of the doctor or Jamie and Zoe and he demands to know where they went. Jervis goes to view the security cameras whilst Kevin and Madeline watch on the view screen as Milo and Dom start to feel the effects of oxygen deprivation as they attempt to find the override device. He then places Dervis in charge of Madeline whilst he goes to look for the doctor and the others, telling him to kill her if she tries anything. Meanwhile, Zoe and Jamie bring the doctor to an abandoned tunnel where he starts to slowly recover. The doctor says that Milo wasn't the one who started the ship, and Zoe realises that there must be a remote control unit on board. The doctor, still weak, says that they must hurry and find it before anything happens to Milo and Don. They make their way to the control room, where they are seen by Madeline, who distracts Dervis by calling him a coward for not standing up to Cavan. Dervis raises his gun to shoot her, but Jamie dashes forward and throws off his aim, and the resulting blast hits the control unit for the override device. Jamie then knocks out Dervis as Madeline tries to use the control unit, but to no avail. The doctor takes it off her as she begins to beg him for help. The doctor manages to reconnect the air supply, and they try to radio through to the ship, but neither Milo or Dom answer as they pass out due to lack of oxygen. As the doctor and Madeline discuss the lack of contact, Dervis awakens and sneaks away, but his absence is soon noticed by Jamie, and Zoe says that it won't be long before he leads the guards to their location. Madeline seals the doors and they go back to trying to contact either of the men on the ship and she is eventually answered by Milo. He tells her that Dom is fine but before he can say anything more he is hailed by Hernak who tells him that his ship is coming alongside him. Milo begs him to listen to what he has to say and tells him about what occurred on the planet. Dom comes to and confirms Milo's story and then Hernak radios down to Madeline saying that he will launch a ground assault within an hour to deal with the pirates. The doctor then talks to Milo and guides them through on finding and disconnecting the override device. Suddenly, they hear Caven, who was found by Dervis in the tunnels and filled in on the situation, calling from outside and telling Madeline that he's disappointed in her change of heart. He then orders Dervis to place demolition charges on the atomic fuel source of the mine and shoves him away when he tries to protest. He tells Madeline that they now have only 40 minutes to live before the entire complex is reduced to dust and he gloats that he would be safely away by then and he jams the controls for the door, trapping them inside. Realising that her next ship won't reach them in time, the doctor says their only hope now is Milo, and he goes back to helping him disconnect the override device. After some trial and error, Milo eventually manages to reactivate it and starts to fly back to Ta. Down in the atomic fuel depot, Dervis has carefully put the charges in place and he takes a short break due to the strain on being in the highly radioactive room. Cameron orders him to work faster as the longer they delay, the more likely they will have to deal with Hernak, but Dervis says that he needs to be careful and heads back into the radiation room. In space, Madeline is filling Harlack in on Caven's plans, and he says that the best chance of saving them is to intercept the pirate ship as it is leaving and prevent the detonation of the bombs. He then dispatches Warren and Amino to locate the pirate ship, but after he does so, Caven tries to detonate the bombs immediately, with the resulting explosion being capable of tearing the planet apart with the force of 80 hydrogen bombs. Harlack tells Warren to back off for the time being, and moments later he gets a call from Madeline saying that the doctor thinks he can defuse the bombs. She tells him that Milo and Dom recently made it back to the planet and are on their way to release them so the Doctor can go down to the atomic fuel depot. Just then, Milo arrives and releases the prisoners and they all rush down to the atomic fuel depot. It is now a race against time as the Doctor tries to defuse the bombs while dealing with the strain of the radiation. After several tense minutes, Harnack says they have to risk attacking the pirate ship and orders Warren to open fire. Caven, sensing the end is near, presses the detonator switch but nothing happens as the Doctor manages to disarm the bombs bare moments beforehand. Madeline reports to their destruction of the pirate ship, but the joyful news is overshadowed by the fact that Harnack says she will still need to stand trial for her collusion with Caven. Milo reassures her that everything will be fine, as does Harnack, and she then leaves to meet with her father. The doctor then says that the beacon section of the TARDIS is orbiting the planet Lobos, and Milo has offered them a lift. Jamie says that he would rather walk than go in that rickety old ship. 
Judging by Milo's shock face, the doctor says that he may have to, and they all laugh at Jamie's own shock reaction. End of the story. Now that the story recap is out of the way, I think we'll go to the space version of Trisha's trivia spot. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. So, the space pirates. Yes. Our date for this one, we're looking at 8th of March to the 12th of April, 1969. Uh, The writer is Robert Holmes. So, it's the second of many (laughs) writing credits for Bob Holmes. We previously discussed his work just the other week in The Crotons. And his next story will be Spearhead from Space. So he has a lot of stories quite close together. Yeah. The director for this one is Michael Hart. This is Michael's only Doctor Who directing credit. Um, He also directed episodes of Zed Cars, Softly Softly, Crossroads, that type of thing. Michael passed away in 2012. We have reached the end. Yep. There are no more missing episodes. A couple of Johns are a little weird and we'll get to those when we get to them where they're like in black and white even though they're meant to be in colour or whatever Mm -hmm. but this is the last serial that has missing episodes where we have to use stills or fragments or reconstructions or whatever currently only episode 2 exists in its entirety in the BBC archives so again and for the final time loose cannon thank you very much for all the efforts that you take to reconstruct these it is much appreciated this is like the third story where episode two is the one that survived. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Apparently episode two, um, in this particular case, it was episode two was recorded on tape. Someone mm. recorded it at home. And that's how they recovered it. I'm like, hmm. well, I suppose if it's air- I'm like, Wait, how did you only record episode two? So it's airing every week. Um, it kind of makes sense. But yeah, so it was a, a video recording. And actually, just before we proceed, on the subject of missing episodes, as of, I think, today... It's officially announced that Evil of the Daleks is the next story to be reanimated. It is, and it'll be out in September. Yes, and I made a comment that I hope that they don't do what they did with fear, uh, the faceless ones and animate the, the existing episode, because I think it's a waste of resources. So, I may have pre-ordered it while you were doing your summary. <laughs> Um, it seems to be that it's going to be a three-disc set, so I think they are going to do the whole thing. But then they're going to do like a, a run through of it that has the surviving episode as well. Seems to be the case. Anyway, back to the story. Yes. <laughs> um, episode six was basically a double banked episode. Right. And what that means is the regular cast wasn't in the studio mm-hmm. for the recording. This is the first time that's happened since Mission to the Unknown, which the regular cast weren't in. The regular cast were actually away doing next week's episode, The War Games. And their bits of episode six had been pre-recorded. So they're actually filming episodes, this episode six of this story and The War Games at the same time, like the production was. So they had pre-recorded their bit and then they fecked off to do War Games. And then presumably the other actors were doing their scenes while the other guys were off. It was also the final episode to be filmed at Lime Grove Studios. So this is the studio that like, you know, in uh, an adventure in space and time, Mm -hmm. you can see the struggles they had with that studio. It was small. It had been like the bane of their existence the entire time they'd been there. They'd been there from an earthy child. This is the last story to be filmed there. This story really is the end of an era for a lot of stuff, isn't it? It really is. It really is. Um, Episode two onwards of this story is where they started filming at Television Center, which is where they would later, like, that that became their home moving forward. For some people who are big Who fans, you know, in uh, the latter half of Classic, uh, this is the first story on which John Nathan Turner was employed. So he was working in the production office from this story onwards. Interesting. You may have noticed at one point... uh, Milo starts sort of giving his version of Over the Rainbow. That could have been anything. Like, I was like because of his diction, that yeah. could have been It was anything. Over the Rainbow, and yeah. apparently it was an ad-lib by the actor who played him. But to be fair, he's eating a fucking boiled egg. Like, you know, what else is he meant to do other than just go... 
Uh, this is the only penultimate story, so the only second to last story, in a Troughton season to not feature a companion departure. So his last two seasons in the You're second right. to last episode, his companions have left. Yeah. Apparently Patrick wasn't massively impressed with the plot of this story. Um, there's a quote from Michael, his son, saying, I remember my father arriving at our house after completing a producer's run through of episode two. He was angry, but anger born of frustration rather than aggression. I recall him complaining to my mother about how dull and unwatchable the Space Pirates was going to be. (laughs) This is episode two and we're still trapped in that bloody awful spaceship set. I told them people will just turn off. I I can imagine coming off set in costume, like some dad from a coal mine, like sitting down at the table, rolling up the shirt sleeves, you know, like smoking a pipe or something, complaining about it. Wendy Padbury apparently has no memory of working on this serial at all. Wow. We can discuss when we get to our overall discussion whether we agree with them or not on their apparent thoughts on this story. On to our cast. So, as Milo Clancy, we have Gordon Gostello. This is the only Doctor Who acting credit for Gordon. His other credits include Tale of Two Cities, The Magical World of Disney, Emergency Ward 10, The Railway Children, Jack and Nori, Zed Cars, and the All Electric Amusement Arcade, which I included just because it looked like an interesting title. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon passed away in 2007. General Nikolai Hermak is played by Jack May. This is the only Doctor Who acting credit for Jack. His non Who credits include The Archers, Adam and A- Adam Adamant Lives, A for Andromeda, The Avengers. He has lots of A's. Mm-hmm. Out of the Unknown, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and The Man Who Would Be King. Jack passed away in 1997. And I, like, his voice, it's a very distinctive voice. Very distinctive. So I was like, I'm pretty sure I've heard that voice somewhere before. So I went looking. He is the voice of Igor in Count Ducula. Oh my god. (laughs) And I went down a Count Ducula um, rabbit hole during the week. And of course there was, hello, ducky boos, (laughs) from from Nursey and David Jason doing wonderful Count Ducula. Oh. Like, I know this has got nothing to do with it, but I love, I think I've loved every single thing that J- David Jason has ever done. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. <laughs> I can see that. As Major Ian Warren, we have Donald Gee. This is the first of two Doctor Who acting credits for Donald. We will see him again as Eckersley in The Monster of Palavan. And I knew, the minute I saw him, I was like, you look very familiar. You look very familiar. Who the hell are you? He's Eckersley. Mm. That's who he is. Okay. Donald's non who credits include Zed Cars, Carnation Street, Born and Bred, Killing Me Softly, Doctors, and Wish Me Luck. As Morris Caven, we have Dudley Foster. Only Doctor Who acting credit again for Dudley. His non who credits include The Avengers, <laughs> Danger Man, The Saint, Steptoe and Son, The Persuaders, Public Eye, and Zed Cars. Dudley passed away in 1973. As Dervis, we have Brian Peck. Dervis doesn't get a Sorry. first or last name. I don't know what Dervis is meant to be. Uh, we have Brian Peck. It's like Again. Sting. <laughs> what? He's like Sting. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is the only Doctor Who acting credit for Brian. His non-Who credits include Doctors, Coronation Street, Last of the Summer Wine, The Bill, Breaking the Sun, and An Englishman's Castle. Brian passed away in April of this year. Lastly, as Madeline Isagiri, I think is yeah. how you pronounce it. Yeah. We have Lisa D- Danieli. I'd go with Danieli. Yeah. We have Lisa Danieli. This is, again, the only Doctor Who acting credit for Lisa. Her non Who credits include Lily Marlene, The Wedding of Lily Marlene, <laughs> The Invisible Man, No Hiding Place, Richard the Lionheart, Out of the Unknown, and The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Lisa passed away in 2014. I was just like I was really hoping there'd be more titles like you know <laughs> Lily Marlene to the wedding the revenge of Lily Marlene <laughs> <laughs> Lily Marlene versus Mecca Marlene <laughs> no <laughs> sad face but still though no. Igor <laughs> oh. <laughs>
So after taking a trip to the trivia spot and taking a slight due tour to, Ca- to Castle Ducula, we're now going to come to the regular section, or not the regular section, the main section of the podcast, which is the character discussion. So this week, as always, we will have the Docker, the companions for both story and allied, sorry, regular and story based. We'll also have some prominent characters and we are going to have our villains as well. Mm-hmm. So... Um, we start off with the doctor, um, and for some reason, my notes on the doctor have disappeared. <laughs> uh, Will I go first? <laughs> yeah, you go first. <laughs> um, I'll be honest. This is not a great outing for the doctor in this story. Yeah, we get to see him science it up a bit, but his relationship with his companions is very strained, at least from what I could tell. And more so than anything, his relationship with Zoe seems incredibly strained. Mm. Like, at the beginning, you have Jamie basically saying, hey, I don't like this, let's leave. (laughs) (laughs) And being ignored, as per usual. Yes, as per usual. But then when they wake up after all passing out when the module blew apart. So, just to put it in people's minds, Zoe is sprawled across Jamie a little bit. Mm -hmm. And her leg is sticking up on one angle or whatever. And he crawls over her, the doctor, crawls over her to wake Jamie. And he spends ages trying to wake Jamie. And it's like, you going to even try and wake her up? You literally went over her to get to him. <laughs> like, what the shit? Um, but also, like, Zoe's pessimism is just her being thorough. And this is the third story, I, I believe, in a fucking row where she has questioned him on his scientific assumptions. And in this case, she was right. Mm -hmm. He made assumptions with the sulfur in the crotons. He made assumptions with the water last week. Mm -hmm. And he's making, he made assumptions with the polarity this week. And this week, he was wrong. She's not being a pessimist. She's making sure you've considered the scientific method and are just, are not just making assumptions. Also, don't be so fucking condescending when she's working stuff out, you prick. Just because you weren't paying active attention doesn't mean you get to be a consenting prick to her because she was. I think that I I, I honestly don't know where my notes went. But (laughs) no, I I did point, I did kind of comment on the fact that he did seem to be a bit more um, short with Zoe. Mm. And it was like you've been in tricky situations before and you've never, you've never been like this. And I'm a comment that I'm going to make, I suppose in the overall might be factored in here is that it feels like there's some real world frustration bleeding into the doctor's portrayal this time. Maybe. I, um, like we, we get to see like, you know, some like sciencey moments. We get to see some of the, we get to see some, troutonisms as well like we get to see like the tuning fork and like the stethoscope on the walls and for all like your know, his you know the predilection for setting up electric shock traps <laughs> <laughs> fuck's sake i but again like we also get to see like you know he's risking his life he goes into the um, the atomic fuel depot like uh grant he's wearing the, the, the suit but he's there and he's like he doesn't get Jamie to help him he goes in by himself and he deactivates all the bombs and so we get to see some good stuff uh, as like the, mm-hmm. even in, like I suppose even, like you know, in the bad things that like you know we talked about with the second doctor there's always been some good stuff as well here is no different really but I, I wasn't a fan of his like kind of condescending attitude towards Zoe I, n- I never am and it's like I under- I get that Zoe is at times like not really aware of how her um, child prodigy status comes across to others, mm. but you are the you're the time and space traveler. You're the one that's been living for near five hundred years. You should have a level of maturity to let you know how to handle people like that. You know. Yeah, I keep thinking like if it had been if it had been Hartnell, mm-hmm. and you know. They have the thing and, you know, Milo buggers off and tells him to stay there. 
and your heart is oh we don't even know where the ship is and you had Zoe going I know where it is he'd be like oh what what show me show me child like you know, what did you do and yeah. he would have been proud of her and encouraging yeah. her and loving it and Troughton's doctor just he hates that she's smarter than him mm. and I'm like get over yourself you should be celebrating this and encouraging her and all you are is every time she says something it's you know not now Zoe I'm trying to this like no she's making a fucking point you're not always right and we've seen that in the last golly the last four stories what came before Crotons um uh we in space when they first meet no because we had the invasion when was the invasion no you said before Crotons Oh, sorry. I'm thinking. Yeah. Of the, I'm thinking of the Dominators. I always get those two confused. I, I, yeah, what, I, can, what can, was was the invasion before Crotons? Inv- invasion was before Crotons and Mine Robber. Yeah, so it's like you know, from that point, she has shown that she is fully capable, and she's shown that she notices things and she can work out things that you fucking don't. But you see, th- this is the thing now that it it's. It's not in every doctor I've known, because I'm just thinking of it there now. It's not in every doctor. But there are times when there are intelligent companions. Uh, like we'll, we'll say like higher intelligent companions that come on board hmm. that the doctor seem, that do, does have issues with. And the results of those interactions, they, they vary, as we're going to yeah. find out. And it's the one thing that about the doctor, I suppose, like, that I don't like is this. It's the ego that you know he has to be the smartest person in the room you know yeah and like th- we've had a few stories now where he has sort of promoted her a bit and been like oh yeah you know zoe go with the brigadier or whatever mm. but like more often than not in that same story he's also being a condescending prick mm. yeah. or like demeaning her for paying attention or demeaning her for being an analytical type of person and it's just like fuck you yeah, it's a very strange relationship he has with Zoe. Very strange. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, it's just like it's just. I don't know what else I can really say. It's just like I wasn't a huge fan of him in this particular one. No, like he said, he did do other things as well. He yeah. scienced it up. He had some good moments, but I think it was because those instances with Zoe happened in like what the first three episodes. Yeah. And like him, like fobbing off Jamie a bit came obviously at the very beginning of the episode. Mm-hmm. Well, halfway through the episode, I guess that later. Yeah. Um, but it's like that was like our introduction to him in this story. So I think it kind of soured everything else he did. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, he scienced up with the magnets, but he was getting it wrong. And he didn't listen to advice yeah. on how to do it correctly. Cool. He was a bit of a Frank Burns this time around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very much so. So companions companions so we have jamie and zoe yes and this time we have milo yes who's a good boy who's a good boy <laughs> <laughs> every time i hear that name that's all i can think of so what do you think of jamie this time around so because i had recently watched it uh jamie gets his own revenge with his version of the three seashells from demolition man <laughs> she doesn't know how to use candles <laughs> <laughs> I I was like, come on, like for fuck's sake! <laughs> also, they had Zoe not understand how candles work. What the yeah. shit? <laughs> no, that that's what I mean. Like, yeah. and like that's a point that I have for Zoe. It's like ah, for fuck's sake, come on! Like, um, there's nothing new from him here. No. Like, there there isn't. It's this is Jamie to the core. You know, risking his life to hold off like the pursuing forces. Like he like. He, Doing his best, Gandalf. You shall not pass. Um, I, I just remembered Sean Connery turned on the chance to play Gandalf and say that line. So at least we have one Scots person potentially saying "You shall not pass." <laughs> um, and it's like, come on, you've travelled with him enough now. He should know to pay attention to his heebie-jeebie indicator. You know, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't like the feel of the place. And to be fair, like from the fucking set, I don't like the feel of the place. Um, so, yeah, like, like I think the people I'm more invested in the, in this particular one, like normally in a in a story, like I'm invested in all three or all of the TARDIS crew. 
Here, I'm more so invested in Jamie and Zoe than I was with the Doctor. But again, there's nothing new to report. From my end, anyway. Yeah, I'd be of a similar thing. You know, I agree with you. People should listen to Jamie more often. He mm-hmm. is usually has a good read on situations and he mm-hmm. knows when it's time to run. Yeah. And, like, this isn't, like, his... I know I said the heebie-jeebie detector, but, like, it, it's not his, like, Highland superstition. It's, like, we've done this enough fucking times to kind of go, this doesn't feel right. We're in an unmanned thing. Yes. The last time Let's we were... Let's fucking in, leave. The last time we were inside an unmanned t- thing, we picked up her, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think people should listen to more often. I think... I would agree with you. I think, you know, Jamie did his Jamie stuff in the story. There's nothing new to add um and actually i find like the last couple of stories we've had nothing new to add to jamie um he's had his jamie mccrimmon effect stuff mm-hmm. um but there's been nothing developmental wise to add to him well like i'm just trying to think now right go back to ian okay mm-hmm. a, a, a male a male companion or just a companion that uh, who had served a similarly length of time to Jamie. Mm. Now, Jamie has obviously surpassed uh, Ian and Barbara. But by that stage, we were kind of saying the same thing. There's not really new to report. We're just, en- we're just enjoying seeing what we do like in action. Yeah. I think the reason why it, it's bothered me so much more with Jamie is because I think just Jamie has shown he can do more. Mm. And they're not give, like, they're giving... They've given Jamie moments of insight Mm -hmm. from a technological perspective. But like even here, like Jamie had the insight that this place is not good. No. Like give me a scene of him standing up for himself saying, look, I fucking told you. Like he always kind of jokes it off like, oh, who knows where we'll end up with this one. Like sure, fuckers, no one knows where that's going. But like I would actually love to see him actually stand up for himself. Yeah. And say, no, hold on. I'm not a fucking idiot, like. Yeah. Like, you, you'd love him to kind of like, you just had to be so fucking damn smart, didn't you? Or like, you just had to go through that door. Yeah, and like, you know, he does it a little bit with Zoe, and obviously she does it back to him, they have a little back and forth, but he never calls the doctor on his bullshit. No. He only ever calls him in a jokey, sort of, side comment way. Like, he never had a, a edge of destruction moment. No. Do you know? Mm-hmm. Um, which I think Jamie kind of needs. <laughs> I have a feeling he's a lot of pent up like tension. <laughs> yeah. That he needs to let out. But like, there's probably something about Jamie in the sense, like you know, his reluctance to, because like at this point in time, the Doctor probably is the only real family jet Jamie has, mm. because Jamie knows that the the the, the chances of being sent to France after the Battle of Culloden, to join the rest of his clan. Pretty fucking slim. Oh, yeah, and he's like, Jamie likes what they do. Yeah. But, like, he's also been doing it long enough to know yeah. when to cut loose, like, and when to, to leave, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, how about Zoe? What do you think of Zoe this time, Um, I refer to my previous point, for fuck's <laughs> sake. How do you not know? Like, Jesus Christ almighty, like, you're one of the smartest people we've seen on the show in however long. How you not know about candles? It makes me really sad the idea that like at Zoe's time in the future, I can't remember when Zoe's from. Um, oh, it's like the mid twenty three hundreds, I think. Yeah. People don't use candles anymore. That makes me a little sad. Yeah, unless it's like you know, um, what is it? Like you're, oh, you're one of those old, you know, fashion weirdos type thing, you know. No, but I like candles. You know? I like no, I like candles as well. Like uh, the, unless it's like Beverly's candle from Sub Rosa, that's a candle you don't really want to be lighting. But you know, although I suppose if you're into that sort of thing, it, it kind of works. Uh, okay, I'm going to call bullshit on this whole candle thing because apparently Zoe is from the late 21st century. Okay. Yeah, no, I call bullshit. Yeah. Uh. No, Star Trek is in the 24th century and well, they still use fucking handles. To be fair, you did teach a bunch of kids that didn't know what a cornered phone was. This is true. And they did think that it meant that I used phones like in Mary Poppins. Yeah. Maybe, I've tried to justify it here, maybe 
Zoe just because like Zoe maybe Zoe's school was in space possibly and at that time you know space travel is still relatively new they don't have the safety protocols in place that you'd have on say I don't know in the Enterprise D where you can have candles lighting all the time so maybe it's just like a safety thing possibly you know? <laughs> uh, but I don't know um there was one moment in this that I did like from Zoe, other than what we've already kind of discussed in terms of her, you know, intelligence coming to the fore in terms of, well, like, her, her natural intelligence coming to the fore, shall we say, mm. was, like, the very tender way that she dealt with the doctor after he, they rescued her from the, the launch pad. Mm. And, you know, take time, Jamie, you know, stay back, you know, he needs air. And, like, like and it's this thing, of, like, no matter how much, like, they may argue or whatever, like, she's always very concerned for him yeah no i'd agree yeah and it, it, as always like she's the voice of fucking logical reason to the doctor's insane ideas yeah yeah like i agree with everything that you just said the one thing i would say is zoe don't let anyone put you down or make fun of you for the fact that your mind is always working mm-hmm. it is a good thing you raise good points and do you know what they'd be screwed without you so and it, it actually that point reminds me. It was just thinking like to kind of say, I suppose in this day and age, uh, there's a show called The Newsroom, and there's a very famous like scene from the start of it. It's a huge monologue. Jeff Daniels does it amazingly, and he says like we used to appreciate intelligence. We didn't belittle it, hmm. you know. And it, it's kind of it was like so never be afraid to be like the, the the fucking voice of the intelligent voice in the room. Do you know what it reminds me of? Well, just not this episode in particular, but the way he treats Zoe. Mm-hmm in general with her intelligence data lore yeah when on the bridge picard tells wesley to shut up yeah and the fact that everyone a lot of people in the fandom just latched onto that Mm -hmm. it's like wesley is a fucking genius and he was correct yeah and it bothered it bothered me that picard just it bothers me that beverly did it yeah in the same fucking scene (laughs) and i'm like Oh, yeah. I fucking hate data lore for that very reason. That was an awkward con- dinner conversation. Yep, but I, that's the sort of same thing I get with a doctor is that like he's one step away of ta- from telling her to shut up. Yeah, and I'm like, dude, no, she's you took her with you, and you've put her in positions like with the brig in the invasion for a reason. Mm-hmm trust that reason it's the same as like in data where it's like picard you put this boy on the bridge because yeah you believed in him fucking listen to him so yeah do you know we love you will we do we do come to ireland sometime will you yeah <laughs> <laughs> so story-based companion of milo clancy okay i'm sorry i could not understand a fucking word he was saying and it wasn't just the recreation. Like, sometimes the audio that they have for the recreation isn't the clearest or whatever, and that's not their fault. I couldn't understand him in episode two either. I understood maybe every sixth word. So, Milo Clancy, despite having the most West Irish name in the fucking history of creation, is a complete caricature of Old West prospectors. He like he's a kind of like this is the type of character that would be played by an actor called Walter Brennan. Walter Brennan, fantastic actor, fantastic Western actor, uh, and it was like you know that sort of you know, not quite Yosemite Sam type person, but not mm. too far off, you know, and like it just, like, it just didn't work. Like I get what they what it felt like. It felt like they were going for Harry Mudd from Star Trek, the original series. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm assuming you meant TOS Harry Mudd and not Discovery Harry Mudd. <laughs> yeah, no, T- T- TOS Harry Mudd. But it, like, it's like it's like they were going for that, but they just completely failed with the with the thing and they just made him like a complete character. It was like, oh, we've seen sci- science fiction media where there are like, you know, cowboy space, space mm. pilots, you know? But the the most cowboy thing about him is that they may speak with a with a Texas drawl and wear a Stetson. This is yeah. like real deliverance area like type hillbilly type act, 
uh, acting. And it just, it, it doesn't work because it sounds like he's constantly fucking complaining about something. Always. Yeah, it, and like, I couldn't understand what he was saying half the time. You, I'll get into a second around him in general. Like, what I thought was kind of sweet, and I would have liked it more if I could have heard it clearly, is like, the way he speaks to Madeline. Yeah. It's like, he's like, you know, my, my darling or whatever. Like, he still, he still sees her in his mind as the child he knew, which is very sweet. You get, you get the impression that he was Uncle Milo at uh, once upon a time. Yeah. And like the way he is with her father, I've forgotten his name. Uh, Dom. Dom. Like, the way he is with them, mm-hmm. it's very, very sweet, but you can't understand it. And so no. you lose that impact. Like you get the sense that they were a very close knit group. He was very close to this family, and like it, the fact that like when he sees Dom, it's like you know, oh, like you know, find a way to connect with him. He's like, your daughter. Remember your daughter. You carry her picture. Mm-hmm. And it's like that's lovely, yeah. and that's so sweet. But it's completely ruined by the fact you can't understand a word he's fucking saying. There's one other thing I like about him, and it's barely touched on is the fact that he's he is the head of his own company okay yeah yet he chooses to go alone in search of the space pirates he doesn't round mm-hmm. up any of his men to take with him he doesn't whatever he goes alone because he's not willing to put anyone at risk for something that's only affecting like obviously it's affecting his company but like it's like i need to look after these people but i'm not going to put them at risk and i like that about him that's the thing i like about the character yeah, like about his character, what I like about him is that he's a simple man with mm-hmm. simple relationships. Not simple as in dumb. Yeah. He's not dumb by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. He's a wisdom and a knowledge that comes with age. Yeah. But he's not overly complicated. No. Do you know? He has an old ship. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it works. Yeah. Do you know? And, you know, why should he get a new one? This one works just fine. And yeah, you kind of have the little bit in episode two where it's like you know oh is he um is he the pirate because he doesn't travel with a license basically and you get the sense that no he's just he's been around longer than the law has been around yeah <laughs> and the Karnak says that you know yeah so like i i i i wanted to like him and i do like him i suppose in, in some respects but i couldn't fucking understand him do you know? I don't know. Is he being cunning? Is he trying to be funny? Is he trying to play dumb? You don't know because you can't get tone and context. The one thing, the one person he did remind me of, though, mm-hmm. is uh, I can't remember his first name. I think it's Correcticus Potts from Chili Chili Bang Bang with his little boiled egg making machine with his toast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like that, that like. like that section it, it goes on for about what, like two minutes of just him sitting yeah. down to try and have like a boiled trying egg trying to eat his yeah. breakfast. <laughs> it's like they, they, okay, this said better, but like for, I was expecting like a sort of a bluff and thunder type guy, not the sort of the um, you know there there's gold in them dar hills type uh, character they turned out to be, you know. Yeah, but I, yeah. I love like when obviously when Hermit calls him, he's just like, "Yeah, what you want? No, I no." Yeah. I try. I already lost my toast. Yeah. <laughs> Will you let me eat my egg for fuck's sake? It's like a Marx Brothers routine, like you know, just constantly being interrupted. Yeah, I think had they done something different with the accent, I think it could have been really great. But mm. the accent just undermined everything. Yeah. yeah, it just it just takes you out of it a small bit. Well, not a small bit, mm. a lot. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So we now have the prominent characters of uh, General Hernak. Which mm. I've always, I, I still find it strange. Like, in nearly all science fiction that I've come across, spaceships are treated mm. like naval vessels. Mm-hmm. Of which a general, as far as I'm aware, is not a rank. No. Although, interestingly, um, when we were watching this online, mm-hmm. uh, episode two had French subtitles? Yes. Was it? Or Spanish? French. Uh, French. Um, and I don't know what he was called, but Major Warren yeah. came up as Commandant or Commander or something. Yeah. Instead. Um, 
So yeah, no, I, I didn't think that general. Although I mean, there's nothing to say you can't. Well, you know, because like you usually like those sort of um, like land. They treat it like a fleet. Yeah, like land based titles are usually done for marines or hmm. you know like the ship's contingent of marines um but yeah he would like you know be a captain or he'd be a commodore or be an admiral or whatever but um just thought it was a strange one but yeah we yeah. have general harnack and we have major warren yeah so i think harnack is a bit interesting because he's very set in his belief that it had to be milo yeah and for me, there's two possible things that could be. And I, I don't really quite know which one it is. And maybe you should. It's either he's completely classist because Milo is this kind of almost like a wandering vagabond yeah. in some respects. He's outside of the law. Yeah. Um, and not even that he's outside of the law. It's that like he doesn't have any respect for the law. He's, yeah. he's not as well-bred. He doesn't use... You know, if you compare the way he speaks to Milo to the way he, the way he speaks to Madeline, mm-hmm. it's completely different. Yeah. Um, mm. I was like, is that a classist thing, or is it just the fact that he's so single minded that he connected A to B and got F, and just was obsessed with I got F, and it has to be F. So, it's I think it's a it's a bit of both because clearly in Harnack's head a hunch trumps evidence. Mm. I was like, no, I think I think it's him. I'm fairly certain it's him. It's like, really, it's you know not the guys that are leaving the the thing as we speak. No, no, it's got to be Clancy. It's a clever decoy. Um, the classes thing, I didn't, I didn't actually think to the classes thing because technically speaking, right, Milo is no different than Madeline. He wants his own company. He wants but his he own presents company. himself as different as the thing. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, but see, that's the thing, is that, like, is is it about etiquette more so than class? Well, but I would consider the two things to be connected. So, like, Milo and Dom started off together, right? Mm-hmm. But if you compare the two, Dom has this big library that he built up. Mm-hmm. And he presents a very classical person Mm -hmm. in that sense. And Madeline grew up with that. Whereas Milo still, you you get the sense that he's still, even though he's like this big company owner, like he he owns one of the biggest fucking mining operations in the sector, in the known universe or whatever, he still holds on to the guy that he was. It's the guy that he was that I think the class issue comes from. See, I, I, I thought that was more like from say like the kind of the legal side like the almost like a weird odo and quark type thing you know the mm-hmm. way odo was like you know kind of going to quark, he knows that quark is shady he knows mm-hmm. it and he's constantly trying to get him on something but he can't he just can't get him and it drives him fucking demented that quark is always out, operating outside of the law mm-hmm. But like, um, well, whereas here it's like a case of like, you know, he makes the point of going like, oh, people like Clancy, you know, they're, they're all odds to themselves. And mm. I think that's what drives him fucking more bananas than some, because like, <laughs> I would, th- like, this is the thing now is that, War- like, kind of like, like, more so with Warren, I thought her neck was kind of one dimensional. Oh, yeah. And like it's like it's tough to kind of go like right is there some sort of weird background in here? There's no like Madeline kind of going ah yes, general, I was speaking to your mother, the Duchess, not that long ago. At which point it's like okay, cool, yeah, he's like you know commissioned you know from the gentry type thing. You know we could equate it to like you know Napoleonic armies that buy their commissions type shit. But it's like the the most predominant thing is over here is like he obviously doesn't like Clancy for some reason, be it mm. the classes thing or just the fact that Clancy operates outside of like there there are some. The, there are some people in various ways of you know, be it military or law enforcement ways of life that just don't like the fact that someone can operate outside of what you know it's it's not illegal but it's just not you know polite looking shall we say. I think the reason why it bothered me so much and the reason why it was the classist thing is because he sees like Madeline tells him that she has two of those ships yeah and yeah, she says, oh, we have this nose cone thing that's unique or whatever. But it's like, the alarm bells should have been wailing. Yeah. But he's like, 
Oh, no, it, it's Clancy. It's like, fucking we went dude. Off, we clearly went off to the wrong ship. <laughs> yeah, I was like, dude, what the fuck? And it's because he's like, again, like, you know, she presented that like, oh, yeah, I bought two of them. But I was like, oh, that's great. Like, great for you. It's like, no, like, is it because you have this different relationship with her? A more genial relationship, you know, that it's, I don't know. It just bothered me. No, I, I just add it to the list, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> so now we've got his subordinate, Major Warren, who I think would be perfectly happy as the keg of the fucking Battlestar Pegasus. It kind of reminds me a bit of Poe Dameron, to be honest. Because the keg of the Pegasus was a bit of a dick. Yeah. Right? Whereas Warren, everyone likes him. He's the nice one mm. of the two of them. And that, that to me, like, he's a bit like Paul Dameron. He's like, he's the hot shot who everyone looks up to. Whereas mm. the CAG, like, he has a little bit of the, sort of the bloodthirstiness, I think, of the CAG. Yeah. But like, he doesn't have the people skills. <laughs> but see, like, the thing is, like, I think like fucking even Hernak's ship, like, I even just think like Hernak is kind of like um, Kane. Kane. And like with the exception of the the only person we see kind of rail against Hernak in some way, shape, or form is the fucking radar technician. Hmm. Pen. And, what? Pen. Ooh, it's his name Pen. Yes, I think his name is Pen. <laughs> um, where's Tanner? <laughs> but like, th- th- this is a case of like you. Know, it's a a commander that goes on hunches, not evidence, hmm. who when presented with evidence, doesn't follow it. And we've got fucking Warren, who just seems to be sort of shooty, shooty, boom, boom, please. Yeah. I think like the reason why I went with more the Poe Dameron thing was just because of the relationship that he has with the rest of the crew. Yeah. Um, but I, I can see where you're getting the CAG thing, definitely. Although, in fairness, I mean, he'd be like a lot of CAGs in BSG, with the exception of maybe Apollo. Because Thrace would have been the same. Yeah. And the first keg that we see probably would have been the same. Yeah. You should join the colonial fleet, Warren. <laughs> <You're fucking laughs> right in. Oh god. <laughs> so now we move on to our villains. Who Jesus Christ, you know, like fuck it. And there was at points I was like, these guys are kind of almost tiptoeing towards the line of villains, but not quite. No. Uh, so we've got uh, Kevin, sorry, Kevin, not Kevin. Kevin's a lovely place. <laughs> we've got Kevin, Dervis, and Madeline. So usually we do the least vill- villainous to the most villainous. So how yeah. would you rank those three? I would say Madeline is Madeline is the least villainous. Mm. Not by much, <laughs> but she's the least villainous. Then there's Dervis, and then finally there's Kevin. Kevin, mm. Jesus Christ. So, I have a quick question about Madeline. Yeah. And not just Madeline, also about her secretary. What is on her fucking head? Well, I like Does to she be- have a helmet for hair? I, I like to believe that this entire story takes place over like maybe about a 12 hour period. Mm-hmm. In which case she's gotten a perm. And the whole thing about perms are you do not get them wet for the first however long. So therefore, she's keeping it perfectly safe. But it looks like that helmet thing has a parting. Yeah. Because okay, from yeah. some angles it looks like an ass, yeah. But from the front it looks like hair. So either she has either that's what wigs look like in the future, in which case, no thanks. No. She has a perm that she's trying to leave set, mm-hmm. or it's a weird fashion thing, where it's more likely it's more likely weird fashion. Yeah. Um, it takes helmet hair to a whole new. Mm. whole new level <laughs> it's like you know we're taking it back we're making it fashionable <laughs> um that was yeah that, that that was like the one really kind of it's like cool your character's kind of interesting but my god what have you got on your head <laughs> uh no i, it was I like so distracting yeah it was and like no it's probably more distracting because of the fact that all we ever see is still images we can't actually see um, actress's name now with uh, Skaysen, but we can't actually see Madeline act. We can't. But in episode it. two, isn't she in episode two? I ah, yeah, but that's two. That's one episode out of like. Yeah, but still, 
but like there's some really emotional bits here and there's some really good acting bits like where she oh yeah goes against Cam. Like, so like that's the type of thing like where you know it is a small bit taken away from the fact that we just have a still image of her wearing like a bucket on her head <laughs> um but like what i think is it's strange is that she clearly joined up with uh Caven's crew out of grief for her father as a way to get back at milo mm. As grief leads you to do strange things, you know. But one thing that I did like is at the end, she, no tears, no no whatever, willingly accepts the fact that she is a criminal and will have to go on trial for her part in a criminal enterprise. Yeah, I like that. I do like her turnaround at the end. I like the way, like she said, she takes responsibility for her actions. No excuses, whatever. The question I have, though, right, and... I'll get into this more with Caven, right? But, lady, you got in cahoots with pirates and you're surprised they're killing people? Yeah. What the fuck did you think they were doing? Maybe they're nice pirates, like the pirates of the Penzance, you know? <laughs> they just <laughs> sing. <laughs> like, that's the bit to me where it's like, you're like, oh no, you shot this guy. I don't fucking know. I never would have done... What the hell did you think they were... You're trying to destroy a man's livelihood, destroy his company, get him arrested, and whatever. Destroy however many lives in a sort of financial aspect. Mm -hmm. And so you got in league with pirates who get referred to all the time as pirates. Yeah. (laughs) Crack a fucking book, lady. What do you think pirates do? (laughs) Again, twenty first century, not that fucking far removed from. There, there's a book in his li- in her father's library. There had to have been. She, yeah. surely to Christ, a man of that type of taste read her fucking Treasure Island or something growing up. Yeah, something. Uh, you know, but like, like, and again, like, just go back to the point where she takes her medicine. Is like, even with Milo saying that he's going to, and, and Harnack, who is going mm-hmm. to try and you know, you know, give testimony for amnesty. She's like. You, like still, I'm willing to accept my punishment. Like I'm not presuming on any favors here. I'm presuming that my guilt will be absolute. Uh, Going back all- to Milo for a quick second, I do mm. love how he never knew why she hated him. Mm. But as soon as he actually meets her in person, it's yeah. she's the little girl that he knew. Yeah, I love that. I love that about him and about the way he treats her and i love that at the end of the story she accepts that she accepts that dynamic that they clearly used to have once upon a time mm-hmm. some relationships that you just can't break some you can some you can't mm. so now we have dervis okay so dervis initially comes across as this poor schmuck who got caught up in something way bigger than himself mm. where i lose all pity for him is the fact that he keeps going back. Oh, absolutely. Like, I I was expecting him to turn at the end. Yeah. Due to his constant questioning of Kevin's methods and order. But he's a complete and utter fucking coward. Like, he had the perfect opportunity to side up Madeline. To turn, ev- the, turn King's evidence or whatever against Kevin. <laughs> Space King. <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching Sharp. Leave yeah. me alone. <laughs> <laughs> he had he had several opportunities to do that. Mm. And each time he skulked off back to Caven again. After complaining that Caven was blackmailing him, as like you're you're being given several outs. Take them, fucker. But do I say it's like the Willy Wonka thing. Stop. Don't force me to do this, please. Help. <laughs> yeah. It's, just, like, it's like rolling in the eyes. Like at the start you you, you kind of feel sorry for him at the beginning. But then after a while, it's like, no, fuck. You're just a moron. No, oh, absolutely. A spineless moron. And he got his just desserts. That's all I'll say. Yes. Yes, he did. And now we have the man with a plan. Caven. Who's an asshole. Because reasons. He, re- he reminds me of Odysseus from the Mythmakers. In the sense of violence is his base setting. Mm. <laughs> And when he's pissed off, uber violence shall reign. In watching this, he wasn't done any favours by Loose Cannon. Because no. they used the same, like, three pictures of him. Yeah. 
and the one they use most often, he has this really demented fucking grin on his face. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like um, when Jack Nicholson was in The Shining it's like, like in the book it's a slow descent into madness for the character in the movie it's like it's Jack Nicholson what the fuck did you expect was going to happen <laughs> um, love that man wrong for that part mm. um, uh, but yeah no, it's just like he, no, he, think what uh, Kevin is he does feel like a legitimate threat much like Odysseus did he does, but his plan makes no fucking sense. Oh, like no, it's like, he's almost as bad as Harnack in his like one, he's like unidirectional type thing kind of going. No, it's going to work because I say it's going to fucking work, and I've got a gun to back it up. But here's the thing, right? You know, we've talked a little bit in the past about story plot points that make no sense, or were maybe carryovers from previous iterations, or whatever. He faked Dom's death. Mm-hmm. And kept him locked in that room, according to Dom, for years. Yeah. And it was certainly long enough for Milo and Madeline to split ways, mm-hmm. for Milo to set up his own company mm-hmm. and do his own thing separate from her, and for it to have been years since the people on um, Lobos uh, last saw him. Yeah. His own his own people on on his own mining planet. Yeah. So have they been raiding this man for years? Because it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like they've been doing it for maybe a couple of months. They said two years. I think two years is the time scale. Yeah, but it's like, how long did you wait before you started? Yeah, because Madeline is not eight years old. No. I was like, how, how long did you keep that man alive? Why did you keep that man alive? It makes no fucking sense why he kept Madeline's father alive. Yeah. He gains nothing. She didn't know he was alive. What the hell? Like, that's the thing where like it really like the the timing of this makes very little sense. If it had been over a couple of months, you yeah. know, where um, Dom and Milo split up into two companies years ago, mm-hmm. you know, they equally split in half and they each did their own thing. You know, maybe Milo wanted to stay or Milo wanted to stay more sort of classical, like you know, old school with it and. Dom and Madeline wanted to be more futuristic and look look further forward and you know invest more in future technologies or whatever. And so they decided amicably to part their ways. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of months ago, Dom died. Madeline, who never saw a body, mm-hmm. who never heard, who, he just never came back, blames him. And you've cave and come in going, oh, well, the last I saw him, he was doing this. And then the, if it was over a couple of months... I think the story would make a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It would make sense that Caven had kept him alive for a couple of months in case things go off the rail and he had to pull his trump card up. Hey, look, you know, he's still here. You fucking do what you do what you need to do. But um, yeah, no, his plan is way too, it's way too fucking convoluted. And so we come to our overall. So at this point in the show, we're going to give our thoughts on the story as a whole. We'll give our scores out of five. So Paddy, I'm going to put it to you. Do you agree with Patrick Troughton? Do you think there's a reason why Wendy Padbury does not remember this story? Or do you think that it's a diamond in the rough? So I think I've always said this once in the podcast before. Mm-hmm. But I was very, I was bored watching this. I was normally my thing is one a night. Mm. I think I watched this over like Jesus a week and a half. Mm. I like I was just and yeah, there were points where like I'm going to admit this that I was like falling asleep writing the notes for it. It's just like I know I I was like going like you know, and it's, this isn't a, the first time I watched this story. And mm. weirdly enough, I watched the war games before I watched this. Because you came up to the house with the war games. We watched mm. like the first seven episodes. You went mm. home. I kept the DVD. And then I watched the remaining three episodes. Um, but then like, uh, yeah, like I watched the Space Pirates afterwards. And I was like, Jesus Christ, like, I'm only watching this now because I have time to kill before a flight. Um, and here it's the exact same thing. Like, you know, a lot of stories have changed for me. Good, bad, you know, for good or for worse uh, mm. on the rewatches this no it's the, the exact same 
and like I thought at the time was like oh is it because it's the last missing story or is it like you know it's like the last one before the last Patrick Trone story and it's like no like though that stuff doesn't factor into things at all you know because like I really enjoyed the smugglers before we watched 10 planet um and that's also a missing story you know so it's just I didn't know what it was and it was just like it's just not an engaging story and I get an awful lot of there's a sort of going through the motions by uh, Fraser, Patrick, and Wendy. Mm. So I have given this a, I'm going to say a generous 1.5 because there are some things in it that I do like. Mainly Madeline's character progression, mm. her interactions with Milo, who, despite the fact that he's a flawed concept of a character, or flawed portrayal of the character in terms of the, like, the, the way they decide to go with it, I think the concept of the character is actually quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And I do like, you know, Zoe's moments, you know, and and, then Jamie's moments, but everything else, like, it's just, it's not an engaging story. Um, The logic for both villains and prominent characters is not good. And plus the doctors, he's kind of like, he's an asshole in this. Yeah. And like, again, he's done, he's kind of good moments, much like Wheel in Space, but he's still a fucking prick. So, so what did you say you gave it one 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 point five one point five, not the, not the best, not the best. Not not this was like the um, the continuation of the strongness that we were hoping for after Seeds of Death. Mm. So before I say anything about the story as a whole, the ship at the beginning, yeah, or the ship that the pirates use when it's coming into dock. So for context, it has a very long nose section that sort of docks into a gap in it. Mm-hmm. It looked like something you'd see on Wallace and Gromit. Because it kind of looked like it had a face. Yeah. And it was a very sort of Wallace and Gromit-y kind of smile type of face. Um, which was really distracting. <laughs> Every time, they because they used the same shot. Obviously in the recreation, they used the same shot over and over again. Yeah. Uh, every time it came in, I mean, if it was coming like like full on like you know coming at you like 90 degrees or whatever you have like the nose section pointing out and then you've got like two little lights yeah on top and then two little lights at the side and it just looked at like this weird demented smile <laughs> coming towards you it was so fucking weird <laughs> so that was the first thing i noticed okay second thing i noticed this story has a lot of setup mm-hmm. so people may not be able to gauge it so much from the recap no. our main cast don't appear until 15 minutes which is over halfway through the first episode yeah first episode is like just a shy 24 minutes i think yeah and they don't because i actually paused it and looked they come in about like the end of 14 start of 15 minutes mm-hmm. which isn't necessarily a bad thing in this story it is and the main reason it is, the story was boring. Mm. Our main cast don't really contribute anything of note until the last two episodes. Yeah. Like once they fall down into the cavern thing and get rescued. And even then, they don't really do a whole lot. They help free the guy that gets shot so Madeline can have her turnaround. That's, that's what they do. Mm. That And that's where their direct involvement and their direct impact on the story I think really kicks off yeah because even like you know getting Milo he was already involved and you know the crew of the fucking Battlestar whatever they were already chasing him mm-hmm. our heroes didn't change anything but that, no. that was already happening <sighs> the story characters they're not the most engaging. The most engaging would have been for me, Milo. But again, like I said, that was completely destroyed by the directing choice and the choice they made with his accent. Madeline was good, I suppose. I, again, I, I, I love the way he speaks about her. I, like I, I wanted to love him as a character, but he was just so fucking annoying. Mm-hmm. And like Loose Cannon did a great job with the reconstruction. Yeah. I think it's probably one of their best from a reconstruction perspective, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of watching it, you don't feel like 
it's obviously a reconstruction, but it doesn't feel as bad as some of the other ones. Do you know? Yeah. They did a really good job of it, but fuck me, the story is just meh. Like, yeah. you're saying that you struggled to watch it every day. Yeah. I watch these stories in one go. Mm-hmm. And about halfway through episode three, I was half tempted to kick it up to 1.5 times speed so I'd get to the end faster. Jeez. <laughs> I was like... And the only reason why I didn't is I did check to see what it would sound like. And because of the reconstructed audio is never as good as clean audio, it sounded shit. Yeah. So I had to watch it through at one point. Well, I actually was very tempted just to kick it up to 1.5. Yeah. Because I was, I just wanted to get the end. I was so bored. And it's like... Yeah. And like, as you said, like it's got nothing to do with the fact that it's a reconstruction. Because as nope. we said, like the fucking guys at Deuce Cannon did a fantastic job. And like, yeah. like, the, the, we, like we're, this is the last time we're ever going to talk about Deuce Cannon. So we'll say it once again. Guys... Thank you for everything you did for the Doctor Who community. Thank you oh, so much. Oh, definitely. And like I said, I think this one is probably one of their better reconstructions. Mm. Do you know, there was very little of them having to, you know, do the weird self inserts that they sometimes have to do. Yeah, <laughs> or the, the photoshopping of like they did some photoshopping of the head into various different poses and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but it, it's not as obvious as some of the other ones they've yeah. It was actually a very good reconstruction job. Just mm-hmm. the story they were given to deal with was absolutely meh. Yeah. And I feel bad because Crotons wasn't great. No. And now we have another Bob Holmes story that isn't great either. And it's like, Bob is great. Bob writes some great stuff. We're just not there yet. I was like, oh, like you know, it was like, oh, like the Crotons was the Bob Holmes story. I was like, oh my god, this is gonna be great, and it was kind of meh. I was like, oh, okay, the second Bob Holmes story. That first one was like, oh, that was, that was just warming up, and now we've got this one, and it's also yeah, because as you because you just said, like what else we got, like the um, we got the space, you know, sorry, not the space bars, we got spearhead, the spearhead, like that's Jesus Christ, like that that was a that's time a, warrior, but like like. Spear, spearhead from space like we talked about like oh like new era starting for like you know when Trouton mm-hmm. came into it this is a fucking complete gear shift spirit is a complete gear shift everything you thought you knew about Doctor Who completely changed completely yeah. and we'll get to that more in a few weeks like but like, yeah. so Bob does great stuff mm-hmm. and it's really annoying that I didn't really like his first two stories yeah so for me I, w- I was kind of struggling I initially gave this a two mm-hmm. but looking back over our notes uh, the last thing I gave a two, if I can find it. Uh, okay, I gave the honored pilot of an unearthly child a two, and I gave. What the hell is it? Uh, I think it was the space museum a two. I gave the underwater menace a two. I enjoyed the underwater menace more than I enjoyed this. Mm. And I didn't particularly like the underwater menace. This is the lowest score by us. Like this is near gunfighters territory, and I was. But it's uh, better than gunfighters. I will say I that. Say, I was angry watching the gunfighters. Yeah, I was <laughs> bored watching this. Yeah, which is a difference. So, for me, I don't like. I gave gunfighters a one. Um, you've given this a one point five. I'm gonna go at one point seven five. It's not a two. Hmm. But, is it a one point five? I don't think so. I wonder if this is just personal preference. Do you know? Um, Gunfighters is a bad story, <laughs> mm, yeah. in my mind. This is a meh story. So yeah, no, it's like, like okay, I'm not going to run out to watch either of them. No, I'll put it that way. But this is the better of the two. No, that DVD is still available, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, this has been a very rocky season. Yeah, I mean, looking back through the scores, so you've had two. 2.5s that being the Dominators and the Crotons mm-hmm. and you've had a 1.5 yeah I gave the Crotons a 3 yeah Um, though I admitted that they had issues um, I didn't love it as much as I thought I would with Bob Um, I gave the Dominators a 2.5 as well so our current average for season 6 your average is 3.04 and mine is 3.21 which when you consider that we have the invasion in there we have the seeds of death in there. Yeah. Ooh. Um, it's a rocky final season. And I wonder, um, we'll talk about this more in future stories, but 
there was a very real chance that this season would be the end of Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. That Patrick would leave. Yeah. And that would be it. Mm-hmm. That was a very real possibility. And I wonder if that's where some of these stories are coming from. But again, like I said, you've got you've got the invasion, you've got fucking seeds. Seeds. You've, like, you've, got, you've even got the fucking mine robber, which is fun, like. Yeah. And like the Crotons, while I don't think it was the best story, it was conceptually very interesting and Conceptually very interesting. Uh unfortunately the production of it yeah. let it let it down. And I think yeah. we made that point kind of clear the last day. Yeah. No, however, we have one more story left to go on this season. We do. And it is unfortunately it's the final episode story for Patrick Troughton and unlike uh, our beloved Doc Bill he was in his full health and therefore he was up to the full scale epic that is the 10 part story The War Games so like the invasion we're going to split this into two different parts where there's going to be uh, two five part uh, episodes coming out and there's an awful lot of stuff coming up in the war games and I cannot wait to discuss it. <laughs> so next week we'll be discussing episodes one through five. We will give our thoughts on episodes one through five, but we will not be giving a score. No. That will come the following week. Yes. We'll discuss episodes six through ten. Mm-hmm. So until then, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>